Let's see. Hi, everybody. My name is Rob Canzaneri, and I'm the chapter leader of the Data Architecture Group. And I want to thank everyone for coming to the meeting tonight. And I really want to thank Mickey for, uh, I know she, uh, we worked together a lot to get this meeting to happen, and I just really want to thank her uh, for coming tonight. Um, if y'all want to talk to me, uh, email me. I'm Rob at SQL Tigers, and, uh, or you can go to my website, SQLTigers.com, and um, send me an email, and you can send, uh, I, I'll forward to Mickey if you got a question, or we'll, you know, she's going to take questions during the session, and some she'll break, and uh, if your question's not answered, we'll make sure that uh, I'll send it to her, and she'll get them. So, so um, this is a big deal here. Uh, you don't have much time. If, um, if you use this code, you'll save some money going to pass. Um, you got to the 17th of July, which is a couple days. So uh, please register uh, and use the code and save some money. So um, pass has lots of virtual chapters, as you can see here. And, uh, you know, one of my friends is, I have a lot of friends in the different virtual chapters, and they all have free webinars. So um, I encourage you all to go check it out at sqlpass.org slash vc. And um, here's some real big events coming up, uh, SQL Saturdays in Canada and U.S. and across the world. And uh, if you're in Baton Rouge, uh, you want to see, uh, please come to the Baton Rouge one August the 6th. I'm going to be talking. I have a really cool topic. I, um, I'm going to talk all about how I optimize a backup and a restore. We had a horrible backup. It took 273 minutes when I first started it, working on it, and I got it down to 17 minutes. And it gave wow, my life back. Great. And I used a lot of cool techniques. And uh, please come and uh, say hi. And Kenny, who's, I want to say, uh, Kenny, thank Kenny for coming tonight. He's helping me. And myself, we're both going to be going to pass. And please uh, look for us. I mean, you know, I love to say hi to anybody on the, from the chapter. And, uh, you know, it'll be great. I'm excited. So. With that, I'm gonna change. I'm gonna let uh, Mickey take it, take over. I'm gonna change it over to her. I hope I get the right one. Let's see. It is uh, did I get your screen, Kenny, or her uh, Mickey screen? That was that was the uh, that was the wrong Mickey. Okay. Sure. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we'll get it. Let's try this. Is yay. So there we go. Okay, we got it. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to mute myself, and thank you, Mickey. Our, thanks for coming on tonight. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, sorry about the dog barking. My daughter just got home and didn't have keys, which causes our dog to bark. Um, I am happy to be here this evening, and i am tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a senior database developer at a financial company. I'm not a consultant. I've been working with Microsoft products. Uh, this year will be 22 years, and I'm a Redgate nerd. Uh, they're a vendor with wonderful products, and I've been using their products, gosh, five or six years, maybe longer. So tonight we're going to be talking about how to change, how to change your habits uh, to improve your SQL. And I have several objectives for tonight. We're going to start off simply with talking about readability. And you may not really think about how formatting can help you, uh, but it can help you troubleshoot your code because you'll have a standard way of looking at code. We're also going to talk about how to set some templates and why they can be beneficial to your team. And then we're going to start looking at actual code. We're going to talk about uh, some patterns, uh, for instance, top-down design and how that may not be the best way to go. Uh, some of the other things on here, we're going to talk about different types of table structures, uh, user-defined functions, uh, cursors, as well as select star. So let's get into it. So formatting your T-SQL. This can be very beneficial because you'll have a standard way of looking at it. That way, when you're quickly troubleshooting, especially those really nasty ones that are like three, 400 line, uh, SQL uh, store procedures, uh, if you can read it quickly, you can really get to the heart of where the problem is. 
Some of the other things that are helpful are comment blocks and who wrote it as well as who's modified it. That way, if you're not familiar with what it does or why it does what it does, you can go back to the original author or whoever worked on it last. And that will allow you to, to get some more information on it. Whatever you do, be consistent in your formatting. That is the best way to have a good formatting um, standard. And this last one is very important. If your entire team doesn't agree on how to format your code, then they're not going to apply it. They're going to go, yeah, yeah, whatever, I don't like that. So you really need to have a, a consensus with your team, whether it's commas on the left or first word up to, uh, on the first row, uh, and then your more complex structures like with statements or when you do actually need to use a cursor. Uh, so those are things that you want to think about. Now let's take a look at uh, some of the, oh, I'm going to go to the next slide and then we'll go look at an example, or two slides. So I'm asked uh, quite a bit, what are some of my formatting pre preferences? And these are just mine. You may not like these, you might have additional ones. I really think that words should be spelled out. We're not limited to you know, 10 or 12 characters like we were in the DOS days, way back when we were just inventing the wheel. Now we can actually use full words. Now, you need to balance that. I'm in the financial world, so we have FICO scores in our database. So I don't want to spell out FICO. I don't even remember what all the letters uh, stand for, but it is a standard in our industry, so we use the abbreviation. But I wouldn't use PWD for password because you can, it's not that long, and I would go ahead and spell it out. ID, I would leave as ID, but I wouldn't put some other, you know, CPSU uh, to talk about a college. I'm looking at my husband's diploma right now for Cal Poly. Uh, what else would I do? Oh, don't put special characters in your names. They make it difficult on the DBA. They can make it difficult to read. Uh, I was in an interview and they were showing me some code and they had slashes in the table names and I was just flabbergasted. Those require you to have um, square brackets around your names and if you're a DBA trying to create some scripts to do management across several servers, well, there's places you have to put the square brackets and there's places that you need to omit them. And so then they end up having to fix their code all the time until they get all that worked out. And so that doesn't help your DBA. Uh, we have an entity framework that gets used and they default to putting a period in there for schemas, which means uh, for an index. So if I was going to read an index, it would say dbo.dbo.mytable. Uh, so you got to make sure you got square brackets in there, but if you're just reading it, it it's not helpful. Uh, stay away from reserved words. They require square brackets and they can be misleading. We have uh, fields that say to and another field that says from and those drive me nuts. Use capitalization, but that's up to you. Some people like to use underscores. I try and avoid underscores. Um, comment your code and remove old code. If you're like, oh, I, I might need it. Well, uh, get in the habit of using a repository to store your code. That way you can store each iteration of your SQL. And that can be very helpful so that you don't have to leave uh, old code in there. You take it out and you can go back to the repository to find out what it was. Now some of these things I like to do, um, I create a, a what I call a living document of standards. You could also call it a knowledge base. And I include in there everything that I want my team to do. But you have to be careful. Don't create a 20-page document and expect them to start using it right away because they'll be overwhelmed, they won't remember everything. So you really want to slowly give them standards, you know, the most important ones, maybe there's a page of the most important ones and then slowly add to it. Uh, this is an example of how I've written a standard document. I write the correct way to write this case statement and then I write a common way that I saw in code. 
Now, one of the other things that I do is as I'm adding to the standards or as I, want, I see standards that aren't used and I want them to start being used, then I send out uh, an email to the team that has some tips on how to improve their standards or how to uh, improve another area. Maybe there's a, a bad pattern that they're using and you want them to improve upon it. Don't call people's names out, but send it as a, a helpful tidbit. I also send out important blog posts. Um, first I post it on Twitter that I was reading it and then I'll send it, the link to them. It can help justify why you do things the way you do. It helps educate them so they can make better choices. I also like to create templates for them to use so that store procedures will have the air handlers I want or there will be a standard naming convention. So I'll share those with my team as well. Now what about providing templates? Well, there's some things that you can do. Uh, one, SSMS provides a place for you to store templates for easy accessibility, and I'll show that in a minute. Uh, I already talked about having a standard. And SMS, SSMS provides a way for you to have parameters so that you can dynamically add code to the template that, they're, that you or them are using. The way it's created is it's got three parts. The first is the field name that you're using as a reference. The second is a data type. And finally is a default value. Now, if you don't have a default value, you can leave that empty. And most of the time I use string for the data type because it's going into text anyhow. This can be very useful for maybe a database name or a schema name that you're going to use uh, throughout the code, or maybe a table name. Every time you have this exact same green phrase that I have here throughout the code, it will show up in a pop-up dialog box only one time. So if you need to use the database name 10 times and you have that exact same parameter, it'll ask you once and then it'll put that database name in there. 10 times. To access this uh, parameters, you'll use Control Shift M. So you're going to hold Control and Shift M at the same time, and then the letter M, and that will pop it up. So let's take a look at how to build a template and also how to um, use it. So it, there is this thing called a template browser, and this is where you can store your templates. You can access it through the View menu, Template Explorer. And this has been there for several generations of SSMSs. It comes with all of these folders, except for that top one, and they all have different templates in them. I create one for all my sessions that I do so that I don't have to worry about overwriting my demo. So let's start with, um, let's do this one, the create template. Here I have, I double clicked on it, created a copy for me. So if I type some garbage in here and I save it to disk, I don't have to worry about modifying. I can double click on it and I got a fresh copy. Now what if I want to create one and then create my own? The way that works is you right click and do new template and you give it a name. Now this is the funky part. I don't know why they did it. You can't save uh, something that you have in this window. You have to do these steps. So now I can right click and hit edit. And now I can put whatever I want in here. So let's copy uh, this block, uh, this comment block. Maybe in here I want to provide a, a use statement. And I can put db name, string, and a default. Maybe 90% of the time I, my team is using demo programming as the uh, database, and then I'm going to put go. Now if I want to use this same one somewhere else, maybe I want to put it in my notes. I can put it there as well. Now I can save it. I'm going to bring it open again, 
and I'm going to use Shift Control M. And here it is. And now instead of this one, I wanted to use Utility. And now the Utility database has been put in here. So this is a, a great thing to be able to do. Here's one that's more complicated that I've done. This, I only use uh, drop store procedure names in my development environment, but you know I'm coding and changing things, so I have it up there. My comment block, my create procedure, I tend to use the same date parameters in my reports, and then I have my air handler. So now I don't have to worry about people forgetting to use an air handler or in, let's see, in this one, I just have a begin, uh, a begin try and a begin catch. I also have one for transactions so that uh, they're laying out the transactions correctly. So this is a great thing to do. In this one, I can see I have a, a whole bunch of them, including my name. Uh, they can modify theirs and put their name, but uh, this is for my example. So uh, that's one thing I wanted to show you. Let's take a look at this ugly query here. Uh, I talked about this on, one, on the first slide. And if you're looking here, this is really hard to read. I, I see that I have fields, and I see that I have a whole bunch of tables. Um, but if I've never seen this before, that can be hard to read. Now here, I formatted it. And look what I found. I found a subquery I didn't even know was there. And this guy kind of got buried too. This is a tip. Uh, that one is a scalar. Uh, no, a table function. So now I'm able to find out some more information just because it was formatted uh, in a standard way for me. Are there any questions yet? Oh, we just have one comment that he, uh, that Cody says that source control is great. Uh, it keeps people honest. <laughs> so that's all we yes, have. Yes, it does. Yes, it keeps people honest and uh, helps you track back when somebody, uh, I've had it where somebody uh, made a change in production. It wasn't in the uh, repository. It got overwritten. Uh, but then you know who it was because they didn't check it into the repository. And so then you were able to uh, find out who it was. I've also had it where they were good and put comments, and when I went to go update it, I saw that the change was in production and not development. So then I was able to go get them to put it in development or in a repository so that I could uh, deploy it properly. I know some of you are shuddering with the, that. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at my next slide. Ah, top-down design. Now, I came from an application developer's background. That's where the first half of my career was spent. And in college and as an app dev, I was taught to think in a top-down design, right? You do step A, you do step B, you do step C. Oh, I'm doing step C again. Let me take that code, put it in a function, and now reference the function step C. Um, and that way I can reuse my code, and I can think in a procedural way. The downside, SQL is not a procedural language like that. It is based on set theory. So the more you think about how to build your statements in a set-based way, the better your SQL will perform. Now, saying get away from templates, uh, sorry, uh, temp tables. I, there are places for that. In that 400 line store procedure, you don't want one gigantic select statement. You're going to want to break it up. But you don't, you want to do, you want to be smart about it. And there are times where I've seen multiple select statements when they should have just been one. I even had uh, one resource who was having performance problems with this store procedure and he was using the store procedure from the application. So to help fix it, what he did is he broke it up into um, two store procedures, and he took the data from both store procedures and took it back to the application and then joined the two data sets to make one data set. 
Uh, my jaw dropped open when I saw that, and I said, why don't we go back to the original store procedure, and I'll show you how to use execution plans and indexes, and it was so much faster. So that's because he was thinking in a procedural way since that he was an application developer. Now you notice the second point here I have is uh, you want to narrow your data quickly. Now let's say I have uh, five SQL statements in the query and I have to have them. And they're putting data in a temp table and they're modifying it or, um, yeah, we'll just say that that's the scenario we're going to go with. Now, if I grab the data, I have to join data from three uh, tables, and then I stick it in the temp table, and then the next two lines, I'm adding more data, I'm maybe doing some calculations, and I finally get down to the last statement, and then I have a where clause that says, just give me the data for California. That is not the best way to write this particular scenario. I've done all this work. Maybe there's a million rows that I'm working with. And maybe for California, there's only 10,000 rows. What I should have done is in that very first statement, if I don't need any of the other, I should have narrowed it down to just the California data and then work the steps that I needed. This will provide less data um, being worked on it will give you a better execution plan because it may not have to go parallel because there wasn't enough data because uh, not uh, parallel queries are not always the best thing, especially in a transactional system. Uh, they're better usually for a reporting system. So those are some of the things that you want to think about um, when you're structuring your store procedures. Predicates and set theory. The predicates are the portion where you have your where statements or your equal and not equal statements. There are uh, some built-in functions that do not perform as well as others. Let's take a look here. Now, what I'm talking about is looking at the data. When you are using indexes, there are two ways that an index will be used. One is even though it is found an index that is narrower than maybe the clustered index and it needs all the rows, it's still going to do a table scan on that index. So it's going to grab everything because you didn't have a filter. Now if you do have a filter, but you're using, a, for instance, the write function, it still has to do a table scan instead of a table seek. What a table seek is, is it only has to look at part of the data. For instance, maybe you have a field that was, has first name and last name in it. And it's sorted on this field, we'll call it full name. If I'm just looking for everybody whose name is Mickey, I can use the left function. And because the index is sorted alphabetically, it knows it can go down to the MIs and grab the, uh, all of the Mickeys. But if they want to grab all of the Stewies, then they would have to use the write function and compare Stewie. Well, the index isn't um, sorted by last name because that's not the beginning of the field. So it's going to have to look at the entire table to get all of the Stewies. Now, yes, the proper way you would have had first name and last name in their own columns, uh, but this was just an example. Uh, the len, len, which will give you the length, will do that um, in string. Now, notice I had convert. I don't remember off the top of my head which versions, but the convert can be either a table seek or a table scan. It depends on which data type you're utilizing. So that's one you want to go and take a look at, and I believe uh, it's the the dates and which, uh, what do they call it, uh, format that you're using for the dates. Now what are some of the others? The like operator. This is another one that can be a gotcha if you're not uh, thinking about it. And I've seen this at work. If you're using a Boolean at the front of the, the query, uh, the string that you're comparing to, it's not using the beginning of the index, the sorted part, so it has to do a table scan. 
if you know you don't need a wild card in the beginning, then it will be able to do a possible uh, table seek depending if you have uh, the data being filtered. Now when I saw this at work, um, they were using the initials of our company, QBF, and they put wild cards on either end and then they were searching the strings. So I dug into it and I found that they were doing this on the string part of a lookup table. Well, a better way yeah, uh, to do that would have been to use the integers for each of the lookup values that had QBF in it. The other option uh, because it was a, a snapshot, so I was able to see the data, but those index, uh, those IDs weren't in the table, is I looked at the lookup strings, and I found that none of them had QBF in the middle. They were all at the beginning, so I changed it. I took the wild card out, and that made it go faster because it didn't have that Boolean. Sometimes you want to change your ORs into an AND. And this is like going back to uh, Venn diagrams and, and the circles crossing each other to determine if you have unions, intersections, or exceptions. Um, in older versions of SQL Server, it's really had a bigger impact. It, not so much anymore, but it is something you want to think about. There's also the IN statement, uh, which can be used instead of a whole bunch of ORs. In earlier versions, like 2005 and earlier, the in statement was costly. Now it is no longer cost, any more costly than using your OR statement. So you can go ahead and use in if you want to. Ah, another thing on the in operator. Say you have to use an in operator and there's no way around it. Think about what, what it's being compared to. I've seen sort procedures where in the in statement is 10 different values. So I went and looked at the table I was actually looking at, and there's only 12 different values to search through. So what I did is I changed it so that it used only the two that were excluded. And I said, don't include these, instead of saying include the 10. So those are some of those things that you can think about. Union and union all are, can be very powerful and you want to think about how you're using them. The difference, union does a search to see if the second statement's rows existed in the first statement's rows. If it did, it ignores it. If it doesn't, then it'll add it to the results set being returned. <coughs> Excuse me. If you know that your statements do not overlap, maybe you're joining data from two different tables, then you should use the union all because it's going to not do the comparison and that will give you some better performance. Now on my uh, website I have an article about uh, using union and union all in replacing uh, is null. Uh, is null is one of those functions that might slow down the performance depending on your SQL statement. This solution that I, I wrote up is not a, a silver bullet. It will work for uh, some instances and it won't work for others. So as always, you want to try it out in your development environment and see if it helps for the, the query you're looking at. Are there any questions? Okay, yeah, uh, let's see. So we have a question about formatting. Uh, they just have a question, do you recommend a formatting tool to? Uh, is it okay if I say? Yeah, I don't, there's no problem. All right. Uh, as you saw on the very first slide, it said I'm a Redgate addict. Uh, Redgate has a fabulous tool called SQL Prompt. And uh, not only will it uh, allow you to format your code uh, with a couple keystrokes, control KY, uh, it will also provide some uh, IntelliSense that's pretty amazing and templates um, that are like uh, what I showed you already, but on steroids. Um, Maladin, I uh, can't think of his last name. Well, I know it, I just can't say it. Uh, he has a tool that only costs money for the current edition, 
any older editions are free, and he's supposed to have some in there. There's uh, another one that's online that's free, but you got to be careful because you're pasting your SQL into a website, and you don't know if they're keeping it or not. Uh, so that can be a, a stopgap. Uh, one of my coworkers found it and he used it until I was able to finally convince uh, my boss to buy him and a couple others uh, SQL prompt licenses. So you can download and, and get a two-week trial from them. It's a, a pretty amazing tool. Mia, uh, do you have one more question right now? It's just a comment. They say SQL prompt is an easy way to create formatting styles and share it with the team. So it's just, yeah. it's, I use it. I love it. So I, I can say that, you know. <laughs> I'll, show you, I'll show you a quick one. Okay, I showed you my sort procedure template. I hit new and boom, I have that one come up and it automatically shows me my parameters. Um, I also put my name, uh, my server and my name because I'm logged in as administrator and today's date. So that that's the template on steroids. <laughs> so yeah, I, I like that. <laughs> okay, so let's keep going. Uh, let's see where's my next slide here. Implicit conversions. These little guys you have to be careful of. Uh, first time I saw a date data type and a string be able to compare each other, uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I'm like, ooh, uh, lazy programmer, I don't have to worry about it. But it can bite you, so you do need to be careful. Now, the optimizer decides which data type to use when you're comparing two values that don't have the same data type based on a predefined list. And this is the link you can get it from. Uh, by the way, my slides and demos are downloadable uh, from my website, which the link will be at the end. So this is just like when you're doing math, you know, which one goes first, plus, minus, multiply, or divide. Uh, it's the same thing uh, with picking uh, which data type the optimizer will decide on. So let's take a look at some examples of this. I'm going to close some of these windows. Uh, plus it conversions. Here we go. So that you can see what my data looks like. Uh, it's a simple table. It has numbers in a tick field and in a number field and dates in a date field and in a text field. Now in the first two comparisons, I'm joining this test data table to a dimension date table. All this is, uh, let me just run it for you, is a table of dates. Um, usually people see this in reporting applications. I found it very helpful in my transactional systems as well. So I take a date and then I have all the date parts so that you can do grouping and some other great stuff in here. I, I have, usually it's a lot lighter and I have one for time as well. So in the first one, I am joining on the date field to the date from the dim date table. The second one, the text. Okay, let's see what we get here. The first one has 23,000 rows, and so does the second one. Let's look at the messages here. Uh, the second one took longer time and more CPU. Other than that, they were fairly uh, the same. All right, so let's take a, the next one. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a range. I have the date set up, the dates, and then uh, some date ranges. Let's see what happens this time. Whoa. First one, 23,000, nothing in the second one. I'm going to give you a minute to take a look and see if you can see why that happened. And I'm going to take a drinking break, well, a water break. So the difference is how the date looks. This particular one is a string, and this is a string. So it's going to do a string comparison. And this string has the year first. So these are not the same string. This one 
it was able to do the uh, date conversion, uh, conversion to a date, and that's why we still got data. So let me turn on the execution uh, plan for this guy and, and take a look at these two. So look what happened in this one. It has an exclamation mark, and so if I take a look here, you can see right here is the warning, and it says that there was an implicit conversion, and it had to convert something, and it says it may affect your seek plan. Again, because remember what we said earlier, it uh, the if it can't use the ordered data that's in your index, then it's going to have, it can still use the index possibly, but it's going to have to search the entire index as opposed to just part of it. Let's keep going. Let's see what happens to this one. Uh, is that the same one? Yeah. This one, I'm looking at numbers. I'm going to look, now this is mathematically means 100. Uh, but I wanted the numbers to look identical. So what happens here? So this first one I got 190,000 and the second one I got 19,000. So again, I'm getting stuff that I wasn't expecting. So this one I got too much and the other one I didn't get anything. Um, again, this is doing a string comparison and then this one is doing a normal number comparison. Let's go back to my slide deck. Oh, I didn't tell you how to fix it. Uh, <laughs> there's the convert function and the cast function. Which one's better? They are equal, so you don't. It, it's all uh, based on a preference. I'm a. I like the convert one, but that that's just me. So you do want to make sure you use the convert. Um, even, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, right here, I would use my convert. Or actually what I would do here is I would put these in, in variables. So I would say declare date as date equals, and then I would use the D here. And now I know if it's a date. And where was it? It was on my slides. So, very important rule, data types matter. This also includes nvarchar versus varchar. Uh, nvarchar is stored differently, and so there's even some funky uh, rules with nvarchar that has to do with some of the special characters and other uh, non-English character sets. So you've got to be careful with that. Some functions um, will return varchar as well as some will do, I think some will do nvarchar. So you need to go and see if you're comparing an nvarchar string to a returned value from a function. Uh, that could also give you an implicit conversion. This uh, saying implicit conversions can be costly. That's, that goes back to the table seek versus the table scan. So let's take a look at structures that hold tables. A temp table that you usually see um, has a pound sign. It is stored temporarily in the temp DB. Uh, if you're just running in your query window, you have to drop it at the end uh, because it'll, it'll stay across um, SQL statements, not across store procedures though. You also have the table variables. These are the ones that have the declare statement at the top and start with an ampersand. They also exist in tempdb, and I'll show that. It's an urban legend that they are only in memory. Materialized tables, this is the technical name for tables that are stored in your database. Um, for instance, uh, customers. So those are permanently stored in the database. So let's take a look. All of them can be indexed, but there's a gotcha. Table variables do not get statistics, so indexing them is kind of pointless. So creating the index is not helpful for that. Now, temp tables and table variables, each person gets their own version, so they'll have uh, hidden unique names in the temp 
date, uh, temp DB, and I'll show you that. While the materialized tables, uh, those are going to get overwritten by each user. Now, when would you have a store procedure put temporary data in a materialized table? Usually that's done um, when uh, staging tables uh, for ETL processes. Now, here's the other gotcha. What statistics do is they provide some values to the optimizer to help calculate how many rows to expect so that it can pick the best um, execution plan for your query. Temp tables get true statistics. They're created as the data is put in the temp table. So it'll be based on the end rows. Materialized tables are the same way. The statistics are created permanently until they're updated. And there's some rules around that. Table variables assume you only have one row in the table because the statistics are not maintained in the query, in the store procedure, or and that's the life of the table variable. This is for 2012 and earlier. When they did 2014, they decided, all right, one is not realistic. So we're going to assume you have 100 rows. What this means is if you put 1 million rows in a table variable, it's going to do the estimates based on 100 in versions 2014 and higher. If you have one row in the table variable, it's going to assume you have 100 rows. So that's kind of stinky. What I usually do is if I know I'm going to have a set of data, a small set, uh, then I might use a table variable. Otherwise, I'm going to want to use a temp table for the data that is not going to live for very long. So let's take a look and see that in action. Oh, I have one more slide. Let's take a look at that slide. Uh, and I said, uh, actually, I said all this. All right, so let's take a look. Okay, right, so I'm going to turn my execution plan on and run it, and then I'm going to talk about everything here. So what I'm doing is I'm uh, creating data. This is just, uh, there's a million rows, and I'm putting those into three different structures, a materialized table, a table variable, and a temp table. I'm then going in through, and I'm inserting all that data into all three structures. I then turn on some uh, statistics information so that I can take a look at the uh, selecting out of the tables. So here I'm just selecting based on a date, uh, exact same thing. Finally, I'm dropping the value so I can do my tests again. And then down here, I'm using a user-defined uh, multi-line table function. And these return a table variable. And we'll talk a little bit more about them. Uh, so here I can see this is returning a table variable. Okay. So let's go look at the results. When I look at the messages uh, from the statistics information being turned on, what I see here is this is the name of the table variable. No, I apologize. This is the name of the temp table. This is your temp table name, and this is, makes sure it's unique across everybody. Yes, nice short name there. This one is your table variable, again being given a unique name, a much shorter name, but that's because it's still being put into tempdb. So now let's look at the execution plans. Uh, these first several ones are the insert statements, and we want to take a look at the select statements. So when I hover over select, I can see uh, that the estimated number of rows, stay there, is uh, 61. 
And let me show you how many were actually returned. In this one, there are 58. So 61, it's an estimate, so it's close. So that is for the, um, which one? the table. For the table variable, hmm, this says 1. All right, we saw that one. Then we have, this is the uh, user-defined multi-line table. And when it looked at it, oh, that's interesting. This says the estimate is 100 rows that I just crossed out. The difference, why are, why are those different? Uh, the, this one I'm executing in, in the SMS window, the, this guy right here. So it's giving me one regardless of my version. This one is actually uh, the table variables coming from the function, and so it was able to give me that 100 rows. So let's change this database to a 2012. Under options, I can change my compatibility level. I'm going to go and run that last query again. execution plan and I look at the table variable and it has one right there through my red line uh, because it is using 2012 instead of 2014. Any questions? Uh, let's see. Is SS I'm sorry, is SSMS query window, is there a setting to make the execution plan be the, the default rather than having to turn it on all the time? I was asking myself that very question today. <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, let's see, it would be under tools options if it is. Let's see if it's in here. Uh, I can look. Someone might answer it too. Yeah, I'll just spend too much time in here if I look. Uh, I can't remember. I know you can do the results in a separate window. There is a shortcut, though. Does it have it right here? Uh, Control-M. So you can use Control-M to turn it on and off um, if, you, if you like to have shortcuts. So there, I just turned it off, and then I turned it back on. So yeah, I'm doing a whole bunch of... Uh, execution plan analysis and I, I'm having to turn it on all the time uh, for my especially for my demos so I want to I'll send that answer when I find out if it's available or not okay so let's keep going all right user defined functions when I first heard about these I thought they were the best thing since sliced bread why because I come from an application developer background and reusing code is the best thing because we're all lazy programmers and want to write the least amount of, of code. Well, the downside is performance. Scale, there's three types, well there's more than three types, so I'm going to talk about three types. The scalar functions, those are the user defined functions that return a single value and you find them out, in, I usually find them in your select statement or your rare statement. Guess what? The, the select statement that's in that function repeats for every row being returned. You're returning a million rows, you just had uh, one million executions. Maybe that scalar function is adding up 2,000 lines, uh, 2,000 rows from a table. So that's 1 million times 2,000 rows of data being manipulated. Ah, we'll take a look. I can prove that one to you. Multi-lined table functions. These sound great. Okay, I'm not going to use a scalar function. I'm going to have it return a table. I can join it to another table, and voila, I'm no longer using scalar functions. Guess what? Multi-line table functions return a table value, a table variable. What did we learn about table variables? They have no estimates, so the optimizer thinks it's either 1 or 100 being returned, depending on your version. Ah, 
but Mickey, I really, really, really want to use a UDF. If you're going to go down that route, I recommend inline table function. It returns, uh, you want to think like a temp table. So the SQL that's in that table function, inline table function, will get integrated into the main SQL statement. And then you're able to get better statistics, uh, use better statistics, you get a better execution plan. Now, it is not a silver bullet. It will, uh, and I hope I'm not offending any werewolves out there that, that are afraid, that don't like silver bullets. Um, I hope you laughed because that's what you want. Anyhow, um, it's not the answer to everything. There are times that subqueries will be faster or maybe a CTE. So uh, you got to kind of balance it and see which one works for you. So let's take a look at an example here. Functions. Okay, now to see this example, we are going to turn on extended events. If you have not worked with extended events, it is awesome and it replaces the use of the SQL profiler. So it's not as heavy as uh, the SQL profiler and it can do pretty much everything that the SQL profiler can do. Eventually, the SQL profiler will be deprecated. I do know some really good DBAs that uh, they're going to hold on to that profile to the bitter end. So what I have here, the first one I have a scalar function, and here it is, uh, function get order scalar. This is one of those other things that SQL prompt does for you. So here it's going to return an int, and it's doing a select from AdventureWorks 2008R2, and it's summing the, the total to return it. So let's turn on execution plan and I'm also going to open, uh, run this execution uh, extended event right here. I'm going to right click and do watch live data. After this presentation, for those of you that want to stick around, I'll show you how to create this one. So I'm going to move this to the right and I'm going to execute this guy. So it was pretty quick. Now you do want to remember that I'm using a development database. Uh, this is not a very large database because it's AdventureWorks. So you do want to uh, think about this on a grander scale. So here I can see that uh, the salesperson, scan count one, logical reads two, uh, 31 milliseconds for CPU, lapse time for 71 uh, milliseconds. When I look at the execution plan, hmm, there's some data missing, uh, some references missing. I see salesperson, but remember what I said earlier from this guy? It is referencing the sales order header table. We don't even see it. This is why it was such a big gotcha for me. I saw this, there's a scalar function. All right, so it's not telling me anything about what's really going on. In Profiler and Extended Events, you can see that. So here I have uh, the start when I started the statistics. Um, using the database, you can see what's going on right down here in this uh, white area. Uh, statistics, I'm doing my declare statement. And now, uh, oops, sorry. This was my select statement. Query window. Uh, so, well, it's going to let me do that. No, there's some other stuff going on. Oh, that one. There, so here's uh, what I executed. But now take a look at this. Uh, it hasn't stopped running. I've got function, function, function. There's 17 of these because it was executed 17 times. So if I bring this over here, You can see it has the return, and this was the inside of the uh, user-defined uh, scalar function. So that's what's happening in the background that we don't see. I was very upset with the uh, speaker who told me how bad they were, so please don't be upset with me. If you are, you'll get over it, and then you'll be happy at some point with me. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at the next one. So now I have, I'm doing the exact same work. 
Um, this one is with a returning a table variable. And this last one is returning, uh, this is using the inline table function. So the inline table function, the difference, it returns a table instead of a table value. And the entire query has to be in one statement with the return. And yes, you can use CTEs in here. Yay. All right, so then finally, I'm going to compare all these. And I rewrote the whole thing with the subquery. So let's run this whole thing. So now let's look at the statements that came back. So the first one, look here, you don't even see that the sales order is being referenced. It's just saying salesperson. Then down here, it's showing the table value that was being re referred to in the in multi-line uh, user defined function. Here it's using some work tables and still working. Now notice the time is longer. That's just crazy. The statistics aren't going to be accurate because of the, the, the data is obfuscated. And then finally we see the multi-line and the uh, subquery behaving very similarly. In this case, the subquery was faster. So now when I take a look at these, you're going to see very different queries. This first one, uh, as we saw, the uh, uh, what table? sales order header table is missing. Um, this one we see that it's a table value function. And now we're actually seeing everything that's actually going on. And here we have the same query for the subquery and the inline table function. So, I have actually quite a bit still to go, so I'm going to take any questions uh, later. Uh, actually, we just have two slides left. Yay. Okay, so cursors. Cursors are not good. You're, they, they sound good, and they're like a for loop. They're going to keep doing the same thing over and over until you get to a stop point. The thing is, is it's executing that same SQL statement over and over again. And so it is going to have um, multiple execution statements. The worst cursor I ever saw had uh, inline SQL inside it that wasn't parameterized. So it just had maybe the, the first name of people was being concatenated into the query. Why? Because those are going to have their own execution statement. And so that's going to have bloat to the cache where all the execution plans are stored. While loops are cursors. They just look different. They don't have all the extra lines, uh, but they are cursors. Scalar functions are not cursors, but they behave to me like cursors because the SQL is going to be executed over and over again. How can you get away from these? Um, sometimes common table expressions can be used, uh, sometimes cross-apply with the inline table function, subqueries. And the really cool one is tally tables. A tally table is a table with numbers, one to however long you want. Excuse me. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to, to use some mathematical manipulation to uh, do some cursor methodologies. So what I recommend is look up tally tables with the word SQL. And there's some great articles out there. I think uh, several are on SQL Server Central. And you can find out a lot of things to do with tally tables. Uh, one of my favorites is being able to find holes and date ranges. Uh, but you can you do that with a date table as well. So let's take a look at the cursor. Uh, let's see. Because I'm short on time, I'm going to just show one. Uh, here is the example. So I just have uh, strings to be uh, 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 separated out. And I think I still have, oh, I closed it. Let's add this extended event again. Oh, let me close it. It's not full. And now we will watch it again. 
All right. So let's look at the while loop. And it's using, there's the while until we hit 10. It's selecting into a table variable. It's then using um, uh, what's it called, a recursive CTE to uh, separate out the numbers. And then it is summing them and returning them. So I run it. Now we've got to wait for the uh, extended events to catch up. Which makes a great water break. And our report server is not what we're running. Okay, so we'll come back and you'll see that this window is full. I won't run anything else until then. Actually, let me um, close that and run it again. Oh, there it is. It just wasn't waiting long enough. So here it ran and it ran and it ran and it ran over and over again. This was a comment I put in here. Oops, wrong one. So here I can see uh, the code. It's all commented out because I have a comment at the beginning. Yep. So there's that while loop. And I execute it over and over again. Okay, one more slide. Uh, hopefully you guys can stick with me. The last one is select star. Uh, find this in code all the time. You have to be careful with it because if the schema of the table changes, it affects what is being returned. How can that, uh, you're saying, so what? I, I want all the data all the time, so I'm fine with that. Well, it can affect things. I've had it affect my SSIS package. I've had it affect older instances of reports and report server. The two worst ones, one is it affects the index selected to be used, and two, it can break your store procedures if you're using um, the constructs like group by. So I'll show you that in a second. Now you're wondering probably how does that affect the index? Well, maybe I have uh, an index. For some reason, I, oh, here we go. I created a, what's called a covering index. And say there was five fields, and I used all five fields. I know that's what a clustered index does, but maybe I'm using the clustered index for something else. I then add two fields to the table. And now I run it. Well, now it can't use that index, or it most likely won't use that index because it's missing the two fields. At the worst, it will use that index, but then have to go back to whatever the clustered index is to get those two other fields for all their data. So let's take a look at my select star here. Let's get rid of these two. Uh, more than that, let's just close them all. And open it up again. Okay, so here I have, did I do the right one? I did. Okay, so here I have, let's, uh, I know I'm repeating myself. There you go. So they returned different data. Okay, we expected that because it's a star, right? What if this was a very wide row? Uh, maybe it has a whole bunch of notes, and the notes have 2,000 characters in the bar chars, and you're returning all of it, and you didn't actually need the notes. You're returning more data than you did, so you're making extra traffic. Okay, what about this one? This one I'm going to group by. I know that it's all the columns in the table. Great, it worked. A new project comes through, they add a new column, they run the exact same procedure, and it fails because the new data, the new column, is not in the group by. So that's something you got to think about. So now I'm going to drop that column so next time I run it, it will all work. 
end, we made it to the end. Yay! So we covered quite a bit of different functions, that, uh, functionality that you want to take a look at to help improve your SQL, as well as talking about how templates and formatting can help provide a consistent SQL to make sure that it's easy to troubleshoot. So before I ask questions, I'm going to put this slide up for those that can't stick around. Um, you can find this presentation under mickeystewie.com slash resources. Are there any questions, or do we need to cut? No, uh, we, we can go. Um, we're also recording the presentation and going to put it in the past uh, archives for the data architecture. So uh, I'll, I'll have a link there on our main site. Um, one question here is, um, how do you get a detailed list of steps printed in the message window? Is this, a, is this down the query? I think they're talking about the extended events you brought up. The ex oh, let me go back. Oh, in my extended events? Is that what, like, a, okay. Yeah, it's, well, it's in the messages or in the extended events part? Well, it says in the message window. Um, so. Oh, here. You can use a print statement. So print, uh, hi. So now when I run it, it printed, there it is. Ah. All this other messages is because I have the statistics IO stuff on. So let's move it to a clean, clean window. And there you go. Hi. One of the other things that I do, uh, if I'm running similar queries across a whole bunch of tables, uh, I can put the table name here. And then that way, when I'm running a whole bunch of stuff, I didn't like that out because it's not in the group pie. <laughs> Good job, Mickey. <laughs> so then I have what I was referencing. This is great when I'm getting data out of a whole bunch of tables for whatever metrics I'm playing with. Uh, usually they're system tables, and then that way I can tell them apart when I do a union. Yep, that works out really nice. Uh, she actually clarified, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, they asked about, they're asking about the statistics in this message window. So. Oh, how I got that. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I went over that quickly. Uh, these two lines, the set statistics I O on. Uh, let's show that one. I gotta turn these guys off so I can show you. Okay, so if I comment that one out and I do this, so this is just gonna tell me the I O. It's gonna tell me how many scan counts, logical reads, physical reads, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, the other one is going to give you the timing. So now this had the CPU time and how much time it took. I don't know why I, I don't know why it's a whole bunch of them, um, but the first one's the one I'm always looking at. The other thing you can do, which can be helpful if you're testing queries, is let's see, here it is. Include client statistics. And what this will do is it'll show you some uh, some information, and then each time you run it, it's gonna go give you a different column and tell you what's better or not. So now if I run it with just this first where statement. So it's got the second one, and then it's telling me if things are up, down, or uh, the same. So that can be very helpful as well. Hmm. What else? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, they, she's, uh, they, they say thank you. They got it. Okay. Oh, um, let's see. I have a couple questions. I'm trying to, let's see, go up the list here. Ready. Here's one I missed. Uh, they're asking about set the set theory concept. 
how to visualize it in the SSMS query window. Is there a setting to make the execution? Oh, no, I'm read, I read the two questions together. So how, oh. <laughs> uh, it, there's no lines between the questions, so sometimes it's hard for me to grasp them. How to uh, understand set theory concepts? Uh, how, do you, how to visualize them? So I, I, th that was when you had the union screen, I think, the union you can all. Yes, uh, let me get a slide, a uh, new slide. So this one is, visually you got to think of, of two circles. Oh, you got to draw two circles. And they're overlapping. I wish, I don't know if the opacity is here. Ah, uh, darn, doesn't have opacity. Okay, so basically what you have is, uh, we're going to kind of draw a line. This is the, oh, I'm not doing very good here. Ah, it needs to be a different color. So we're going to pretend that's the end of the circle. So when you're thinking about set theory, uh, you want to think in terms of, this is a Venn diagram. So you have A and you have B. And if you want, uh, when you're just doing a normal join, it's, where'd my mouse go again? Mouse. My mouse is stuck. Um, that's always fun. Ah, there it is. When you do a join, uh, it's just the section right here that you're getting back. If you're doing, um, let's see, you mentioned a union. Um, I guess you would, since it's stacked, I would think of it like this. And I would put this one on top. Oops, too front. Okay. So this was returned in the first SQL statement and I used union. So it's going to return all of this that uh, you see. Since this right here, it, the overlap was identical, it ignored it. So I'm not getting those rows from the second select statement. So maybe this had A, B, and C. This had C, D, and F. From this select statement, it's just going to give you D, E, and F. And this one is going to give you A, B, and C. For a union all, it would be like this because it's going to assume that uh, the data from both queries is what you want and maybe you want the duplicates as well. So that would be another way to use union. Uh, there's also uh, accept and intersect that you can use just like union and union all. Um, the other things, okay, Mr. Mouse, there we go. Um, the other thing you would be thinking about, let's move this line again. Bring it to front. There we go. Uh, when you're doing a left join, it's saying, give me everything from the circle and uh, everything that matches. Uh, wow, my mouse is not happy. And everything that matches from the left. So maybe I'm not having good luck with this guy. Uh, there we go. Uh, maybe the here doesn't match. Usually on a Venn diagram when they, they talk about it, I forgot, it's this whole circle. So it's the overlapping part plus everything from the left. So a join was just this. A left join was all of this, and a right join is as if I did this. So it's all of this and only uh, the matching part. So you got, I never use right join. I actually team convert it to left joins because to me using left and right joins in the same query is just really hard to read and get my head wrapped around it. Uh, it was, <laughs> It's always been hard to, for me to get left and right joined in the same query understood. 
If you want to um, have a reference for this, uh, I think if you look up SQL Venn diagrams, it'll, it'll give you this one-page uh, document. Uh, I know the guys at work have it on their wall uh, for those that are learning SQL, and they find it very helpful. What else do you got for me? Okay, uh, well, um, they went back and they said, I mean, ro uh, so they're clarifying their uh, question. <laughs> Uh, so they're saying, uh, they, they, I mean, row-based execution versus set execution. Example, cursors are, are is bad because it is a row by row. Um, cursors are uh, not okay. So if you, okay, so let's go to that example. So that, uh, my cursor example. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So okay, so in the cursor. I am taking this data, so there's 10 rows, and yes, I'm going row one, do all this stuff. Row two, do all this stuff. So that's a row by row, but what it's really doing is it's running this query for each row because there's a query in here or multiple queries. So you're running a select statement. This is one Excuse me, that's one SQL statement, and that SQL statement is going to be ran for every row being analyzed in the query. Can you read me the question again? I think that was what I wanted to answer. I, I think so, too. Um, okay. I, I think you got it. Uh, so um, I think this is the last question. I'm, uh, they're, they're saying, do you have some time to show how you set up the extended events? Uh, yes, I do. So, under Management, Extended Events, Sessions, right-click and say New Session. I'm going to give it a name. Uh, there's some templates. I haven't used them. I haven't done a lot with Extended Events, so everything I've done I've, I've written by hand or I've taken off of the Internet. I've done things like analyzing logins and logouts. Uh, this one as well. So then I went to, the, okay, I thought there was a, a next button. So now I go to events and this is saying what do I want to capture while SQL Server is running. So what I did for this one, I went down to SP, uh, here we go. So SP here Yes, it does mean store procedure. Really should probably call query statement instead of store procedure because it's for each statement that's going to be executed. Now, if you put start and complete, you're going to get two rows. So I'm just going to put start. Um, I think if you use complete, you'll get some metrics on time. I'm then going to add it to the right. And then I also want the initial query, the entire thing that um, the, the whole query that's being executed. So I'm going to grab SQL statement starting. It doesn't matter which order. Now I want to pick what fields are going to be displayed. So I'm going to click on the configure. It shows me the events I'm capturing and, uh, and all of these columns that I'm interested in. Uh, for maybe I want to see what database they're being executed from. Maybe I want to know who's executing it. Uh, there's a host name. That'll tell you where it's coming from. Uh, where's host name? Here, client host name. I love client application name. Uh, in your SQL connection streams from applications, there's actually a, a parameter in the connection string uh, that's not used a lot called application name. And you can put whatever you want in there, and it will show up in things like extended events and profiler. So I'm actually slowly having uh, my team change the connection streams used in web services and in applications to put what application it's coming from so that I know who's causing the problems. I mean, writing good queries. 
And then finally, I'm going to show the SQL text, which is uh, what I'm interested in. Maybe you're looking at deadlocks, then you would want the session ID as well. Now I can go ahead and hit OK, and it creates it for me. So now I'm going to go ahead, the down arrow means it's not running, so I'm going to right click and start session. Now I didn't go over, there's a few other things you can do, I didn't go over in here. Um, you can tell it how to save the data. Uh, you can have it write to a file. You can even, for that file, you can say don't go past 500 gigabytes. Uh, once you hit 5 gigabytes, uh, 500 gig, sorry, not gigabytes, 500 megabytes. After you hit 500 megabytes, start a new file. Don't have more than five files. So then you know how much data, how much space you're taking. So now I'm going to do watch live data. And let's run something other than the cursor. And go back in here. And it'll take a minute. And there we go. It's getting data. Now, hmm, this is not what I was expecting. This is, says Redgate. Well, Redgate is analyzing the system tables all the time, just like the normal SSMS IntelliSense does. Also, report servers running in the background, so some of this is coming from report server. I don't want to see those. What can I do? Ah, one other thing before I leave the screen. If I right click up here and go to choose columns, I can get the SQL text to come over and be displayed. So now I can see what's a little snippet of what's going on in there. So let's go back. Let's close this. Right click, properties. Go to events. Click on one of the events and go to configure. And there's this thing called filter predicate. And now I can put some filters in here. Maybe I want to have a filter that says, uh, what was it? Uh, it was the client, I can't remember what it was called, client app name. And we'll say the one that says, Greater than, no, that's not what I want. Uh, greater than red. Should give me my red cake. And then I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to run it, run it again. Watch live data. It was already running. And we can just sit here. We know some, at least the report server ones will come up. And the red gate one should um, not be displayed anymore. Once it starts coming in, it goes uh, pretty quickly. So here's all the report server ones that I didn't um, boot out. But now I'm not seeing the red gate one anymore. So I was able to filter out the stuff I don't want to see. And there you have it. Um, what I usually do when I'm creating these guys, a new session, I build it out and then I script it out and that way I can put it on multiple servers. If you want to leave it there and um, not have it capture data, um, but you don't want to delete it, you can hit stop session and then it's not running. But you have it for when you need it. Um, we had uh, offshore resources that were trying to troubleshoot um, some deadlocks, and so I created an extended event session to capture deadlocks that they could turn on and off in their environment, um, their dev environment, and they didn't have to worry about profiler. Um, they could also leave it on for an extended amount of time to wait for the deadlocks to show up and without having to deal with profiler. Anything else? Um, well, it's kind of getting late. <laughs> So yeah, you guys. <laughs> yeah. So um, and, and I gotta get my kids to bed. Uh, so um, I, I I can't thank you enough for coming on tonight. And if I missed anyone's question, I, I there I think there's one or two. I, I'm gonna just forward them to you if that's all right. That sounds perfect. And uh, thank you for coming on tonight. And You're would you pick a number, just a random number between one and thirteen for me? Uh, 
Just between one and thirteen. Yeah. Nine. Nine. So let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let me double count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So uh, I hope I say this name right. Harsha Vasa. Uh, uh, you. We have a prize we give away. So you're the winner of the, the you know, the prize tonight. So I'll get your email and uh, and, and and get with you later on and uh, make sure that you uh, get the prize. Um, congrats! Congratulations! So thank you again, and uh, I hope everyone has a great night. Thanks for everyone staying up late with me tonight and uh, watching this great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good okay. night. Good night. Bye. Bye.